he spat pan into that that bin he had next to him and then he looked at me and said chokre teri umar kya hai <laughs> i i end up and i'm also thinking at this point that if he buries me here there is no way anyone can look at me and i go to the tapri stall he buys tea i buy tea and he looks at me and says sandeep tere ko samajhna padega tu jo keh raha hai na ek to hai ki hamari funding chali jayegi logon ki naukriyan jayengi ye main kaise ha bol sakta hu and all this he never told me in the room this is something he told me at the tapri you will work 12 hours every day 12 hours every day 90% of the days you will work 50% of the weekends there is no respite from this any firm who tells you anything else is just bsing you to the highest degree so this is hard reality in today's episode of conversations cafe podcast uh, we have somebody who has been a consultant almost all his life uh, we're talking to sandeep das who is a published author as well and has written four books so far sandeep talks more about his journey his life and how as a consultant he has dealt with people who have shown him a real gun and people who have uh, trusted him with crores worth of business that they were making uh, in this particular podcast he talks about time management he talks a lot about what exactly do we know and not know about consulting and a lot more that has shaped his life if you are someone who's interested in the world of consulting this podcast is definitely for you the podcast with sandeep das starts in 3 2 1 All right uh Sandeep thank you very much for joining us in for this particular podcast Thank you Paul uh, thank you for the invite We've known each other for quite some time now and we have worked together as well I remember our interactions of you know figuring out videos figuring out how to do things on YouTube and it's been a journey for you and me as well and we are going to talk about that journey uh for those who don't know about you uh, you have been a consultant you have been an author of four best selling books you have been a columnist um, and you have been somebody who has gone to probably every i am that exists and given speeches right so there's more to your life uh, that i'm sure about and that's what we are going to discuss today in this very free wheeling podcast that we do which is the conversations cafe podcast so welcome back once again thank you so much thank you for the invite uh, lovely studio and look forward to this so if somebody googles you these are the professional things that they are going to find which i just spoke about what they probably won't get is a personal insight as to who you are and while you were growing up what kind of a person were you so i was born in calcutta and i grew up in hyderabad till class 8 and then i came to bangalore and been there for a long time i come from a very middle class family so my childhood was about playing with broken cricket bats and taped tennis balls and my first profession in life i wanted to become was a tailor because i used to love the the that texture of when the scissors used to cut the cloth it was my dream to become a tailor my parents were horrified when i told them i really want to be a tailor and after a few years i wanted to be an engine driver so i used to love the train journeys during my summer holidays and i wanted to be an engine driver and that phase also went by after some time thanks my parents were very relieved that i didn't want to become an engine driver i have a big foodie uh, i'd like to travel a lot so i've been blessed because of my work i have traveled to nooks and corners of india and outside so i travel a lot and i am also into fitness i run a lot so these are three things which uh, probably in my personal life which uh, which which stand out So you said something very interesting Sandeep that caught my attention you said that uh, you wanted to be an engine driver you wanted to be a trailer tailor and your parents were horrified and it's it's not surprising because in India there are certain professions that are seen as professions where you can't go beyond a particular limit and you can't make a career out of it right and it's something that is fed from very early childhood in our own brains right how do you see that practice do you see see that you know this segregation of work 
or jobs or careers is something that is very organic or it's a manufactured thing from the society itself it, it's a very difficult question and there are many nuances to this see you have to understand which when we were growing up middle class family and we didn't have so many opportunities as say your generation has today a good education was the way to a good life yeah. there was no other way so you study hard class 10 class 12 iit iim and then you had a good life so education was the only way to have a good life so i th- i think that is one of the underlying drivers which are what you see in india today is a good education even without a good education or a branded education you can still have very good opportunities which didn't exist 15 years ago so i think that is one element to it which uh, plays out secondly yes there is an element of uh, societal pressure that comes in but uh, i i was very fortunate because uh, my parents were very liberal so when i told them i want to write books and nobody makes money in writing books yeah. it you put years and years of effort and you can't buy one vada pav out of it so nobody makes money out of books but you get the vada pav in those book pages yes <laughs> yes and and that is a sign of actually on that note that's a sign of great success so i hope my books will be used to make vada pav because that means it's selling <laughs> and that's why the vendor has bought it and is selling vada pav but uh, I, i think that way my parents are very liberal that do what you want but have that formal degree so that formal degree will see you through life and then whatever you want to do on the side you do we will fully support it so i think that's how that's how the equation works but now if you see things are very different uh, but i still suspect and people who are listening to this that always have a good education it will never harm you it will only help you right so in terms of the formal degree you went for the most formal degree yeah. probably possible in yeah. the world yeah. in in india not in the world yeah. which is engineering and when did you realize that you know this is something that probably will make wonders for me and this is something where i'm i i my interest lie after the entire interest of being a tailor to engine driver to whatever else was there later on probably becoming a cricketer or <laughs> anything else when did this uh, interest start so to be honest in class 12 i i studied in bangalore so the default is to become a computer science engineer so i i didn't have so much passion per se but it's just that Uh, it's so big in a city like bangalore that you follow your seniors everybody does computer science engineering because there's so many opportunities so i just followed that blindly it's not that i loved computer science i studied it in 11 and 12 but it's not that i hated it also so i was okay to it and that, that's how we did it honestly i think most engineering decisions of bachelor's degrees you just follow your friends or follow your seniors i don't think at 17 years old people 80% people don't know what they really want to do and i think that's how i got into engineering i actually uh, it's a very interesting thing that you said i actually was coming here and then i met this uh, ola driver that i was talking to he said that his kid is doing a bms degree now his parents don't know what this bms degree is all about his uh, kid is also figuring out probably he's the first generation learner in their family and they are figuring it out and i asked him how did he know about it and he said that because his friends were taking it he also took it okay so that's probably something that yeah. is still continuing yeah. because there are pockets where this information is not reaching to a lot yeah. of people right yeah. is this something that you also believe in and do you think that something can be done to tell people that you know hey if your interest is x there is a y course that's available for you and you can you can do a match the answer is no because you can provide all this information but i think at 17 you will follow your friends and you will follow your seniors mm. I, i think the role of the friend and the role of the senior is huge at the age of 17 years old so uh, i think you can give more information but to be honest such decisions if you look at psychology are taken by the irrational brain which takes most of our decisions so you can provide it i don't think it will change too many too many options right and who was the senior for you in case of you opting for an mba after you were done with your MBA? so when i went from engineering uh, when i finished engineering i started working and i realized i cannot sit in the chair for 12 hours a day mm. my i just cannot do i'm not that kind of a person so then actually because i didn't want to do that job i did the next best thing or probably the best thing which was an mba because a lot of people in my batch we joined together the it company wanted to do the mba because they didn't want to do coding the whole day so that's how we it's not that i had passion for mba 
I have passion for making money. So that was one of the drivers. But but uh, the reason I did the MBA is because I didn't want to do the tech job. You know, you went to one of the best institutes. Let's talk about your experience a little bit because the people who are listening to it uh, probably they also feel that what is going to be my life after I uh, yeah. you know walk out of that B school, right? How what happens in the B school? What how you you know transpire yourself into somebody who can sustain in the world outside, right? So what exactly happened with you there? Were you able to you know uh, acclimatize yourself? Were you one of those students who was very bright and you know had everything under control, or were you somebody who was like wandering around this entire campus and thinking what to do in life? See, we have to understand this black box called the I am. All right, it is. 300 of the smartest people in India who've succeeded all their life come under one roof and they get into a very competitive. Just a footnote, 600 now. Oh, now it's become 600, <laughs> yes. My time was 250, now it's become right. 600. So they all come there and it's super, super competitive. So everyone is an achiever. So one is, what this two years will teach you is that there will always be someone who's better than you because they're all achievers. So it teaches you that emotional resilience that you are no longer the best. You might just not be in the top 10%, top 20%. And you have to get used to fighting with your own journey, I think. From my own journey, what really stood out about my I am Bangalore stint is, and that is where I learned a lot in life, is I had this ability to manage my academics and extracurriculars. I was a part of eight clubs, I would uh, stand for student elections, I used to run two bodies. And a lot of people think you can't do so much, uh, breadth-wise. And what I Am Bangalore did was change my tuning to say you can do all of it if you manage time well. And even today I manage four or five careers. And I go back to my I Am Bangalore days that it taught me the tuning that you can do all of this, you just have to have the right mindset. You have to find your own way. Uh, you have to be very resilient about it. Some days will go well, some days will go badly. But uh, in the end, when you come out, I think you, you, you get a lot more opportunities. There is no doubt about that. Even today, after 15 years, I Am Bangalore opens doors for me. So there is, there is a certain value to that brand. I, I listen to a lot of narrative these days on Instagram that says IIT, I Am degree doesn't matter. All that is rubbish. IIT, I Am degree matters. So. What that does is it opens doors for you. What you do with it is, is your individual skill, discipline, hard work. But it will always open doors for you. You said something very interesting. You said that you started managing your time yeah. while you were uh, at IIM Bangalore. See, when you are at a certain point in your career, when you are doing a lot of things, when you know how the bricks are arranged, it becomes easier for you to manage time, right? A 20-year-old probably listening to this particular podcast or conversation, they probably don't have it figured out, especially because they're dealing with so much distraction, right? In today's world, I mean, once you open your phone, you're gone. Yeah. And how do you then take yourself back and manage your time in such a way that you are able to do the four things that you probably had thought of in the morning? What I used to do is, uh, in my mind, I used to allocate a certain number of hours to an activity. So, for instance, tomorrow is a quiz. I used to tell myself, I have only three hours today. So, in three hours, I will study and I will do the maximum I can in those three hours. Then what happens, your brain finds out shortcuts. So, I used to learn up the index. It's very important if you know the index of topics, if you know the breadth, may not be the depth, you can answer a lot of questions. I would take last year's question papers, know them thoroughly. Uh, I would pay attention in class. So a lot of things were done when I used to pay attention in class. So I had this thing about I will give so many hours and whatever happens in those hours is, is my final output. I do that even today. So even today when I say write an article for the Economic Times, I say I will give it two hours, one hour for thinking, one hour for writing. And your brain will figure out a way to do the best it can in those in those two hours. So that's what I used to do. So the one principle I used to follow is, if you look at each subject and a grade, there are four to five elements to getting a grade. You have class participation, a quiz, midterm, end term, all of this. The only thing I used to try is to ensure that I am 15% above the class average in every submission. So when I passed out of IMB, the maths works in your favor. I was in the top 10% of the batch. 
what happens the mistake people make is they start with a bang and then they collapse after term 2 term 3 and it goes like this if you are consistently above average you will finish with an outstanding grade so uh, it, it's something i've used in my corporate life also if i have to make a pitch you can either spend 48 days on a pitch or you can spend 4 hours on a pitch you will realize in the 4 hours you will produce better quality of output than 48 days on a pitch. So that's that's a principle that has held me in very good stead. Coming to problems of this generation, see, we didn't have Instagram and YouTube, so we didn't have the distractions you speak about. What I do these days is I keep a time limit. I am very active on social media, but I say not more than two hours a day. And I think that has helped me curb it to a certain extent. I think the one place where you waste time is Instagram. I, I genuinely don't see the value of Instagram. LinkedIn is nice, you, you learn, YouTube is good. Instagram, I'm not sure how much you learn. Right. So I, I avoid Instagram. Uh, let's let's come to your consulting journey, which started from uh, I am Bangalore itself. You were interning yeah. at BCG. Yeah. How did you get through that internship where you always targeting to be a consultant? Uh, was it a chance, uh, you know, uh, encounter that happened in your life or was it because you were always in the top 10 uh, from the very beginning that helped in you? No, so I got it as part of my summer placements and our summers in 2008, I think till date was the best summers in the history because the economy was at its peak, everything was going right at that point. So I think in my, our batch and even now, consulting was like the number one thing to do. And hence, all of us tried for it. Honestly, none of us knew what we were signing up for. Right, right. So That's it, something that I also wanted to know. Did you know what consulting no, we, was we, back we, then? We knew, so to be honest with you, I was enamored by the fancy hotels, mm. the fancy airports. And uh, we had this uh, rather stupid belief that once I get the internship, I will tell Mukesh Ambani how to do his business. For some weird notion we had in our minds that we will sit across the table to Ratan Tata and tell him how to run, run the Tata Empire. So yeah, that, that that's the kind of awareness we had. But uh, th those days, I think consulting was one of the big professions. That's why we got into it. We didn't even have these sitcoms that uh, give a great idea of consult. So we didn't have House of Lies. So yeah. if you see House of Lies, you will get a good understanding of what happens in the business. So we were just listening from seniors, uh, putting two and two together, looking at the fancy hotels, the fancy airports, and we said, yeah, let's do it. So that's how that's how it works. Right. And what exactly happened in uh, your BCG stint? Where was it exactly that you uh, had to go to, you know, uh, go through the summer internship? And what was the learning that you came back with? So I was placed in New York. Uh, I went in New York for my internship. Uh, it was uh, it was a very different experience. It was a very different because uh, it, it's not easy for an Indian 21, 22 year old to go to New York. Yeah and sitting in a high-end office. So in terms of pluses, I think uh, the exposure to the industry was great in terms of uh, on one day you have to do so much. You have to do the search, you have to speak to a partner, you have to speak to a client and you have to do so much in one day and that ability to do it is, is a fantastic learning experience. Personally, I think going to the US is, is just amazing at that young age. Yeah. You're just getting exposed to a city like New York and uh, all the various cultures, the variety of people. So that personal exp exposure is great. We also saw the full thing of consulting because uh, I, I remember much before people knew Lehman was collapsing, we knew. Mm -hmm. We had come to know because everything is in that same office and that same building. So we all knew Lehman was collapsing. So everybody was worried that uh, what would happen after this because Lehman is going to collapse, Best Towns is going to collapse, all of the collapses were on the cards. So we, we also saw the, like the first one month we were going like this, the next one month we were going like this. So we, we saw the entire journey in, in about two months. So I think it was a great experience uh, uh, overall. Me and my two friends had gone there and I think people do face certain issues. So I also want to give a reality check. It is, it is not hunky-dory. You will, uh, you will face issues with food uh, if you're vegetarian. I am veg. These days, obviously, it's become a lot better. It's, it's something I should not say, but uh, the big R word exists. And none of us can run away from it. So uh, even if you're Indians and high-profile talent, you will face that R word uh, in the US. Maybe things have changed now, uh, but... So I think the B school students of today, they focus more on the ROI yeah. than the R word and probably that's why they make 
do with yeah. the kind of things that they need to do in life but yeah moving on uh, you know your consulting journey started with bcg and it continued with uh, accenture accenture if i'm not wrong and you stayed there for the longest Seven, time yes. uh, and your career sort of took a shape there yeah. right let's let's talk about some of the things that you did as part of accenture which you still remember like in terms of the impact that you created or in terms of the projects that you worked on in terms of you understanding the value of a consultant yeah. in the entire uh, chain personally if you ask me it is the uh, the number of industries i worked in was incredible so every 6 months i would change an industry i would be in cement one day next day i would be fmcg third day i would be in healthcare and it is the ability and and the first day i remember i went to a cement client i am sitting with the plant head i have no idea how cement is made the guy has 30 years of work ex and he looks at me and he says i am looking forward to what you have to say and inside me i am laughing and inside me i am also crying yeah. and i don't know how cement is made so i think that that learning curve is just incredible which only consulting firm can give you so the number of industries uh, i had to travel so much and when i say travel i don't mean the fancy travel i don't mean the board rooms down south bombay i have gone through villages after villages in india i have met Uh, I have met goons who have threatened me with guns. Wow! Well, what what happened? <laughs> it's a it's a very interesting story. So uh, I hope he's not listening to it now. But <laughs> I I still value my life. But I had just uh, joined Accenture, and uh, one of this was an auto client, and they told me that uh, understand how UP works. We want to scale our business in UP. Yeah. So I went to this place in Eastern UP. Uh, next to gorakhpur called basti district to speak to one of the dealers and auto dealers are big the 100 crore 200 crore businessmen they are rich people so basti district i met this auto dealer and i'm sitting across the table you know i've just passed out from iim i have this new fancy suit and i have this brilliant 15 slide presentation and i am telling a up businessman that if you follow process your business will scale up and for 15 minutes i'm trying to convince him he heard all of it and uh, first i remember i clearly remember first he he spat pan into that that yeah. bin he had next to him and then he looked at me and said chokre teri umar kya hai <laughs> so i i i replied back and i said 24 the guy looks at me and says zindagi mein kabhi kattha dekha hai so i knew what a kattha was so before i could do anything he opens this drawer pulls a gun and he puts it in front of me and this is real i'm not making this up at all and you know when you're 24 passing out of iim bangalore you you tend to be a little cocky you know, i have i'm someone so i looked at him and i said ye khilona hai ki ye chalta bhi hai <laughs> you know thank god he didn't he didn't use the gun thank yeah. god so then then what happened is we had the chat and he took me to this uh, farm house he had behind huge farm house So this is like barren land, not what UP you see today. Right? Ten years ago, barren land. So I'm sitting there, and this is like a farmyard with cows and buffaloes. He gets one chair. He says, "Chokre bet idhar." I sit there, and he's sitting there, and uh, I see his wife about ten meters away. She has this swivel knife, and she's chopping hens like this. The head, chok chok. She's doing that, and some of that blood is coming onto my suit. So he looks at me and said, "Dud piega." so before i could say something he got one of the cows and he milks the cow live in front of me in a mud cup and he gives it to me and said chokre isko pee and i i am a very urban boy uh, and as i'm coming from urban you know, brought up in bangalore etc so i have never had raw milk and i am looking at it and all my eighth standard chemistry is telling me don't have unpasteurized <laughs> milk don't <laughs> so and i i end up and i'm also thinking at this point that if he buries me here there is no way anyone can locate me this is basti district 2010 no cop will ever come to me so i end up having the glass for people who haven't had raw milk it is amazing it is amazing and i i have that i finish the conversation and i i come back so that tells you that not always your class 8 chemistry is right you should try out things <laughs> beyond what is taught it also in the tells you class 8 chemistry is not right it also tell you that communication principles yeah. 
just because you have 15 brilliant slides doesn't mean the other person absolutely, will listen absolutely absolutely and that's what i was hinting to as well because sometimes we think that whatever we are learning in in a control classroom yeah. is something that we will implement yeah. in the, in the journey and then things will just magically happen that doesn't yeah. work it, it doesn't work it doesn't work i think uh, over the years i've figured out it is the human to human connect that is what matters you have to i, I think what happens is we get we get sort of become prisoners of these tools slides uh, presentations we become prisoners what we have to understand is there is a human being i am a human being i have to talk to him in a way that appeals so over a period of time i have and i've worked with many ceos in india i have always realized that if you have tapri chai with them outside the building is where you can get maximum work done when because when he's having that tapri chai he's put that personality aside he's talking to you as an equal his mind has got cleared up and then when you tell him you need to look at this need to look at that he will give you a lot more value i'm so, going to put you on spot and i want another story of that tapri that has happened with you if something of that sort of sort of happened so you you have told me a story of a rural village in up now i want to learn a story where you went to a glass door office meet somebody who is very big and then you actually went down to have a chai with them on a tapri and things actually worked out for you So I'll give you uh, what happens in a glass door example. Might not have been a tapri, but yeah. I'll give you a glass door example. I was working for uh, a client in Delhi, and I can take their name now. It's, it's called DCM Sri Ram. For people who come from Delhi, they are very, very big in in Delhi and North India. They have multiple industries. So I used to work for a partner. I was, I think, I was senior consultant, twenty eight, twenty nine those days. And uh, the partner one evening came and told me, "Kal to Sri Ram board ko present karega." तो सारे कह रहे हैं कि मीटिंग है आ जाना आई ऑब्वियसली थॉट सो एट दैट पॉइंट आई थिंक अजय श्रीराम वॉज ऑन द कवर ऑफ एवरी मैगजीन एंड ही वॉज आई थिंक द सी आई आई हैड इफ आई नॉट मिस्टेक एंड ऑफ फिकी हैड सो आई वॉज नहीं इज ऑब्वियसली नॉट गोट पुट मी इन फ्रंट ऑफ दैट गाई आई मीन दैट गाई कम्स इन द न्यूज एवरी डे सो आई सेड ऑब्वियसली वो ऐसे ही मतलब चबी लगा रहा है मेरे को सो द पार्टनर वॉज अ फैन ऑफ स्ट्रीट फूड सो ही केम नेक्स्ट मॉर्निंग एट नाइन थर्टी एंड ई गॉट समोसाज and he looked at me and said sandeep tu baat karega tu mat khana tere gale pe agar effect ho gaya to meeting ke baad khana that's when i realized the guy is actually bloody serious of me presenting to the shriram brothers so i did something we had a deck i prepared i walk into the room and i see the three shriram brothers sitting there and i know that guy because i've seen him in the news every day i seen him in every magazine and there's like a room of 30 people massive massive board room 30 people me and the partner and one more guy had gone and the partner says uh, hello everyone my name is x sandeep will take you through the presentation and he goes and sits behind and i have done that and they were so polite i mean they, he mr shriram i mean i was a 28 year old he's run this billion dollar business and they were so so polite with me the way they spoke to me with so much respect and they were genuinely asking me what do you think and i could make out they were genuinely interested in what i had to say so uh, i think i've had that experience yeah, yeah. then i go down with him in the lift and uh, i said can i join you for tea and i go to the tapri stall he buys tea i buy tea and he looks at me and says sandeep tere ko samajhna padega tu jo keh raha hai na ek to hai ki hamari funding chali jayegi logon ki naukriya jayengi ye main kaise ha bol sakta hu and all this he never told me in the room he told me downside tu ye nahi bol sakta hai tu kaise tu samajh raha hai hamara pura itna sara jo paisa hum laye hain hum ye bolenge to pura paisa chala jayega hamara and that is when i realized this is the real information he's saying that you cannot touch people you cannot touch channel partners he said tu jo bol raha hai naye business lana hai ye number main bhi samajhta hu but tere ko samajhna padega agar ye naya business aayega hamara existing jo businessmen hain channel partners bahut powerful hai वो स्ट्राइक करेंगे हमारे साथ और हम उनको हैंडल नहीं कर पाएंगे वो बहुत पावरफुल है तो ये तेरे को रियलिटी समझना पड़ेगा दिस इज समथिंग ही डेंट टेल मी इन द रूम दिस इज समथिंग ही टोल्ड मी एट द टपरी एंड देन वी केम एंड वर्क आउट वी चेंज आर टैक सो इन माय एक्सपीरियंस व्हेन यू गो टू द टपरी इज द ओनली वे यू कैन रियली यू विल नो व्हाट इज इन हिज माइंड व्हिच ही इज नेवर गोइंग टू टेल यू इन द बोर्ड रूम सो दैट्स हाउ दैट्स हाउ इट इट वर्क्स एंड यू लर्न ओनली यू लर्न दिस विद एक्सपीरियंस इन टर्म्स ऑफ हाउ टू इन्फ्लुएंस पीपल fascinating in need and uh, you know the experience only teaches you that it's not the fancy car yeah. the fancy flights that you take it's the yeah. work that you do and yeah. every day how you yeah. make an impact what is in in your journey has been one of the most challenging things that you did as a consultant what exactly is a consultant's role i want to understand from this example so 
for example, do you actually change fortunes of companies? Do you actually need these very big people as you just mentioned about the Sri Ram founders? Uh, what exactly affects you as an individual while you are doing all this and the impact that you create? So think of a consultant as a doctor. A company will come to you and say, I am growing at 2%, but all my competitors are growing at 8% do something so that 2% goes to 8%. So a consultant comes in yeah. or, a, or a, so you're a doctor or a company might come to you and say that uh, my attrition is 25%. I want to reduce it to 15%. Figure out what is the problem and help me execute it. So these are the kind of problems you typically get. So, so you are cross-sectional within the business. It's cross-sectional within the business. Sometimes the problem statements are not even clear. So. I remember I once had a client in the food and beverage space. He told me that I am number one today. There is nothing wrong with my business, but I don't know what will happen three years later. Can you ensure I'm number one in three years? Projections. Yeah. Projections, trends, business models, employee, talent, look at everything. I have no problem today. So you get those kind of statements also. As a consultant, I think what is richly rewarding is there is an input and there is an output. Input is when you when you build this point of view, when you design programs, convince people, get it executed, I think that is very enriching. And when you see the result and things moving, that is really value. I remember I worked in the alcohol sector once and I had crafted this narrative for them that you need to go mass. Yeah. At that point, everyone was going premium. If you are alcohol consumers, you will resonate with this. So I was telling them go mass. That is where the fortune of the pyramid is. And the company was going premium and I convinced them method after method, survey after survey, about probably my toughest. And they were at 12% market share. They decided to pilot after convincing that 12% shot up to 24% in one year. And I, I remember the, the person who was heading the business at that point came up to me and said, congratulations. And I think that's when you hear gives you a real kick in life. You can, so I can never write on my resume, that guy told me congratulations, but in my mind, that's a, that's a moment that really stands out. And what is your uh, take on that? Like, for example, now, why a lot of these students also want to get into a consulting or an IB business is because, a, a job, sorry, not a business, is because it pays a lot. It gives you a kind of a freedom that, you know, if you go from an I'm A, B, C, L, I, K, whatever it is, you pay off your loans easily and uh, you get that financial independence again and you're not uh, sort of paying your EMIs and loans and everything of that sort, right? That's the idea, that's the hello that's around these careers, right? Do you think somewhere, because these institutes keep on rising the fees, a lot of these students also are piling up who want to be in these fields because it gives them a lot of money. Is it just the aspiration that they have or it's also because they, on the back of their shoulders, they have a loan to pay? To answer your question, I don't think the education loan dictates the choice of field. I, I think that doesn't happen. Why do people go to tier one institutes? Let's be very honest, they want money. Yeah. They want good jobs, they want good money. So there is no, that's the only reason, 80% of the reason why people do a good MBA from a tier one place is the money and the job. It's, it's a hard reality. Now, after you come there, the only place where this education loan plays a difference is if you want to be an entrepreneur or do a job. If you have a big loan, people push, postpone that entrepreneurial decision. But if you are decided to do a job, I don't think across sectors it plays a role. So it's not that people do investment banking because they have a loan. People do investment banking because they want to get rich, irrespective of the loan. Let's move on with the, the career uh side of things that we were talking about you after your stint with Accenture, seven long years that you spent there and the stories that you told us about consulting, you you became a director yeah. at PwC. Now, I want to know when and how does this growth happens in consulting? How long can you sustain these very long work hours that is a given for consulting and was it the case for you as well? And how soon or how delayed it can be for you to reach a level of a director when you start off as a fresh graduate after your B school. So the work hours are long, make, make no mistake. So you will work 12 hours every day, 
12 hours every day, 90% of the days, you will work 50% of the weekends. There is no respite from this. Any firm who tells you anything else is just BSing you to the highest degree. So this is hard reality. So if you want to enter this industry, people who are listening to this discussion, know what you're signing up for. There is no respite. So which means sometimes you will miss birthdays, you will miss family parties, uh, some of your vacations over the weekends will get cancelled. It puts pressure on your uh, relationships. So all of this is a part of the deal. Yeah. Uh, you will put on weight if you don't, uh, if you're not physically fit. Uh, you will eat junk. So all of this comes as part of the package. So it is long hours, know what you're signing up for, that's one. Second is if you look at the career path, and this is the career path. If you are coming out of business school, you typically join as an analyst or equivalent. Different firms call it different things. And in two to three years, you become a consultant. So as an analyst, what you do is you just own all the data. Yeah. So all the data, primary research, secondary research, you largely own all the data. There is limited client facing. You will uh, not face very senior people as an analyst. So after two to three years, you become a consultant. Mm -hmm. And what happens as a consultant is, uh, if a project has three work streams, you will own one work stream and you will design the problem solution. You start meeting the head of the uh, work stream person on the client side and you start designing those solutions. Then this is also about two to three years. Then you become a manager and the whole project you run. So you have a team of three or four people, you design the work streams, you manage the client, manage the financials, manage everything. And you stay as a manager level for three to four years. And then you become something which is called a principal or uh, these days people call it associate partner. There are many terms. Essentially, you do delivery of a project and you start selling new work. You, sales is about 30%, 70% is delivery. Uh, then you move to what is called a director. And some uh, MBB calls it partner also these days and others call it the equivalent term of a director where you do a lot more sales, about 50% sales, 50% delivery. And then you eventually become a managing director where you have full ownership for everything uh, under you. To answer the question, and that's the explanation I give, till manager, careers are fairly regimented. Two to three years, you will keep moving up. Uh, it's, it's fairly, after bec you become a manager, it gets down to how good a consultant you really are, the relationships you have, the business you can bring in, how people value. So till manager, you can get in between six to eight years, depending on where you are, how experienced you are. After that, it totally depends. After that, it totally depends. How much business, how much people like working with you, what are your connections, what's your brand, all of that starts factoring in once you become a principal. And does the long hours change after eight years? Or no, it years? doesn't. It, it, <laughs> it, it doesn't. It doesn't change. Absolutely doesn't. Change. How are you getting time when you were doing all of this? Again, you said that, you know, you were doing time management when you were in your B school as well. But you needed more time now because now you were writing as well, right? When was that time when you started writing? Were you frustrated with the work were you doing? Or you were thinking that, Abhi bas ho gaya. Abhi now beyond consulting also there is a lot of experience that I've gathered. Now I have to get into this. So I started writing because of the guy who put the gun in front of me and I thought this was too good an incident <laughs> not to start writing. So and the way I would write is uh, I would write two hours on a weekend. Uh, so on a Sunday I would spend 10 to 12 and two hours on a Sunday I would write. Through the week, obviously, I would think about what I want to write. I had this small notepad with me. I would write down ideas. And every Sunday I would write for two hours. And over, and what happens is, so every Sunday if you write two to three pages, in about a year, year and a half, you have a book ready. So that's the way I used to manage my writing. It, it was very good. It was extremely relaxing to my brain. And uh, it, it's an addiction. Once you start writing, you feel like writing more. It's, it's an addiction that that happens. And that, that's how I produce my first book, second book. Once you're on this journey, the writing just keeps uh, happening after that. So that, that's how I typically did it. I wanted to ask you this and I forgot. Uh, you know, you have been in different countries as well. So whether it's the South Asian countries or it's US or other countries that you travel to. Uh, what has been one brilliant experience that you have had in these countries in terms of, you know, whether it's business, whether it's consulting consignment that you have had or a, a business proposition that you are solving that made you feel that this is something that India should definitely implement. 
I remember when I went to Philippines, my perception of Philippines was, uh, uh, this is a poor man Singapore, when I started going. And when I spent time in Manila and, and Makati, Makati is the CBD basically, I was blown away by how much progress there is there in Philippines. The, the, the way people spoke, they were so fluent in English, uh, the entire influence of the Spanish culture. Uh, what really stood out in my experience in Philippines was uh, one, the, the, the fluency of English was just fabulous across the board. That was one that stood out. Kudos to their education system. Second is, what really stood out for me in Philippines is every woman works in the workforce, is what I saw in, in Manila. And, and she has an equal say in the household, the expenses, the decisions. It is incredible because my perception of Philippines wasn't that. And I realized that we as India are, are very far away from this reality. An urban to urban India, if I compare urban Philippines to urban India, we are very, very far away. So that role where women have an equal voice is uh, was, was really, really st uh, stuck out with me. Great, lovely. Uh, you mentioned about how Philippines, in Philippines you found that a lot of people could speak English and English is the language that you chose also yeah. to write, yeah. right? What according to you right now is the situation where we talk about English literacy in India? Why is so much importance given to English as a language? How do you see this as something where a lot of people in India, like which is the, probably the majority of the Bharat, is still struggling with the language? Where are we exactly right now? What are we doing wrong? And what should be the approach for us to take from here on so that we may make a balance? So I don't know whether I should be in favor of saying that uh, we should implement such measure measures that everybody should learn English. Or I should go back and say that, you know, why is it even needed? You know, one of the reasons India has become a tech superpower is because we have a talented workforce that speaks in English. That is one of the reasons China did well, but couldn't do as well. And India took off because we had so many people who could speak in English. In the future, uh, if you look at industries like tech, if you look at industries like pharma, they are all going to be global businesses. Yeah. India is becoming a global superpower. And you will need English as a primary medium of communication. There is absolutely no doubt about that. So fluency in English is a huge skill set that is, that is required. Between two people, one person who's fluent and saying stupid things in English and the other person who's not fluent in English but has great content, the first person will move leagues ahead. So. Yeah. So even in the 10 or 15 years that go forward, fluency in English is extremely important to everybody who's listening to this. Don't be under any other illusion because a lot of our economy is uh, driven by uh, industries which have global connections and you need to be good at English. To look at the second part of your question where you spoke about Bharat, are we better than where we were before? The answer is yes. Is it? as good as it should be, the answer is no, obviously. And I think what every person has to look at is how do I make my spoken and written English up to the mark? Every person has to think. And you don't need to take fancy courses for this. It's very simple ways to do this to people who are watching this discussion. One is just read the Times of India or any English newspaper for one hour every day. Just read it. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And once you finish that, just speak in front of the mirror for five minutes on three or four stories that you remember. Yeah. If you do this for six months, you will see a tremendous improvement in your uh, spoken and your written English. The one thing which typically works very well is watching these web series. When you watch some of these American web series, although with subtitles, you will naturally see your fluency is, is growing up a lot. Okay, let's talk about your recent book that you have written, how business storytelling works. And that's something that people who are listening to this conversation would be very interested in because half of the business that you do is storytelling, yeah. if not more, right? And probably you would be the right person to write this because you were a consultant whose job is to sell stories, right? So 
how did you come up with the idea of this book what exactly is there in the book and what yeah. would i get as somebody who is in the field of business or not is going to get from there so the way i so i used to do a lot of uh, storytelling workshops for corporates and at iims and i used to get this great feedback from the participants so that's when i realized why not put some of these learnings churn it into a book and then take it forward so if you look at the book the book is divided into three sections the first section looks at principles of storytelling so we think as people in business that we are good storytellers the answer is not who are the best storytellers the best storytellers are script writers or movie writers so one element i look at is a whole chapter on movies how are movies written what is the science of story- storytelling in movies the second uh, g- place to look at storytelling is psychology understanding how your brain works it is a known thing that 99% of your decisions are irrational only 1% of your decisions are rational so how does the brain work and how do you appeal to that brain so the second element looks at psychology and the third element looks at evolution okay. the only reason human beings have survived is storytelling so the part 1 looks at these three aspects of movies evolution storytelling to identify storytelling principles part 2 and 3 is about application of these principles so part 2 is storytelling for a corporate so if you are an entrepreneur how do you use storytelling for yourself if you are in marketing how do you use storytelling for yourself if you are in consulting how do you use storytelling for yourself if you are in sales how do you use storytelling for yourself as a company part 3 of the book is how do you use storytelling for yourself as an individual so how do you make better slides using storytelling how do you speak better because of storytelling how do you handle humor how do you how how do you become a more funny person using storytelling how do you build a personal brand using storytelling so that is part 3 of the book which looks at these principles it's about 225 to 230 pages uh, rocket paced in terms of in terms of the book so yeah so the one interesting thing that i have seen while i've spoken to a lot of these people is you know when you are early career professional you always tend to compare yourself yeah. with the ones that are yeah. above you yeah. right and that's something that we don't leave until yeah. a point in our lives has that happened to you in your life as well when you see that you know your batchmates at i am bangalore are doing such great stuff they are owning their own companies which are making hundreds of millions of dollars has that affected you it's a very difficult question to answer and i think it is it is normal to compare initially and uh, you will feel bad you you will feel bad uh, because uh, and and what happens is i am makes you extremely competitive you're not just comparing on salaries you're comparing on multiple things like uh, their insta photo versus your insta photo their vacation versus your vacation their wife versus your wife their headline versus your headline so it comparison happens at every level so it it is difficult but i think over a period of time you you learn to live with it you you see your achievements and you see your struggles and you and you live with it the one thing i think it's important to understand is it's a good thing to compare if you have the right mindset if you can see what is my batchmate doing and can i copy some of it it's a very good thing to do if you look at a batchmate and say i am jealous because that person is doing so well that's probably the wrong attitude but i think in in a society like india you will be forced to compare if not your batchmate your neighbor's son neighbor's auntie all of that that whole societal ecosystem will make you compare and you just have to have to live with it uh, live with it after some time so it's it's not easy but people live with it sanjeev in terms of your career now what are you thinking ahead of you right now you you know we are undergoing a lot of changes yeah. right now as well and Uh, you always tend to feel like you know am i relevant anymore because things are changing yeah. so fast people are moving so fast so the ideas that i probably had 5 yeah. 10 years back are they going to work anymore or not so what is your take on the time that's going to come in front of us so these are very exciting times but like you rightly said i think research has shown that every 5 years the existing skill set is going to become useless so one open ai comes in and so many industries get disrupted the way at least people like us look at ourselves is we have to learn every day uh, and I, i learn sometimes from 20 year olds 21 year olds they teach me so how do i learn every day 
So uh, I spend one hour on reading newspaper, business magazine, and do that religiously. Uh, half an hour I listen to podcasts. So there are certain podcasts like uh, I listen to a lot of The Economist, keeps me updated. I listen to uh, the New York Times. The, the globally, what is happening, you need to know. So 30 minutes of podcasts, one hour of reading. Uh, I attend a few events. Sometimes I speak, sometimes I attend. And that's how we keep updated in terms of that. The one skill set I've always believed you should know is uh, no matter whatever job or industry you are in, you should be able to do every task. So when I got into YouTube, I did video editing first. Not that I'm very good, but I can do it. I learned it myself first before I started outsourcing it to a freelancer. So I, I think that mindset is very important that under me, whatever work is there, you should have the capability to do it. You may not have the time to do it. And I think that is when you really, really uh, move forward. Even as AI comes in and as, as, a, as a role and where I lead the strategy function now is we, we look at applications of it. But I am familiar with most tools. So I can look at mid-journey. I can craft those images. I can write those narrations. So th I think that, that mindset is very important in life where everything you should be able to do, you may not choose to do it. And then you have uh, taken up the hat of a mentor as well. You mentor at uh, Altune as well. You're part of the management consulting yeah. certification program that we run. And uh, you're going to be uh, guest lectures in some IAMs as well is what you were telling me. So how has that mentorship journey turned out to be so far? How, what satisfaction or joy do you get out of doing it? It's, it's very interesting that I learn more than I give during my mentorship journey. It's someone who's 10 years younger to me, very different stage of life, sometimes different parts of India. And we learn so much in terms of, uh, it, it's, it's important to acknowledge there's a certain privilege I have because of my education, uh, because I, I went to a private school. There is a certain privilege that helps me every day. And I have never understood the value of it. You understand the value when someone who doesn't have it comes to you and is struggling because of that. So sometimes it's humbling on things we just assume. Sometimes we just learn from their lives in terms of how they are approaching uh, their life. And sometimes it's, it's just incredible to see their energy. I remember a 24-year-old came from FMS and come to me for mentorship, was working one year in a very nice bank and wanted to give all that up and start his firm. I mean, that takes guts. I cannot do it. But I am admiring the guy on the other side who's ready to do it. Doesn't even come from a well-off family. It comes from a very middle-class family. But has the guts to do it. So sometimes you learn uh, also on the other side in terms of that. And just meeting different people, learning about their struggles is, is just a remarkable experience for mentorship. So Great. Lovely. I am going to draw a close on this particular conversation here because I want to leave our audience with the thought uh, of the importance of mentorship and you know understanding where you come from and what you are capable of. Uh, I'm glad that uh, from your uh, tailor journey to the engine driver journey to becoming a consultant and now an author is somewhat giving you joy right now as to what you are doing. Uh, and you're not in the pursuit of making a lot of money and you are happy with what you have. Yeah. And I hope that this continues uh, in your life as well. Uh, one parting thought that you want to leave our audience with uh, in today's podcast as to what their learning can be from listening to you in this entire hour that we have spoken about. There are actually many, but one, uh, I have always faced this question of, you have to make a choice. You either have to do a corporate role or pursue your passion. And I have done this for 15 years. I have done well in both, not given up on one. And I think you need to tell yourself, I am going to be greedy. I am going to do everything. I am going to succeed at everything. And uh, that's because you can have it all. I think that is very important to go. You don't have to make any choices in life. You can be good at everything. Super. Thank you very much, Sandeep, for your time. I really appreciated you opening up and telling us these stories. And I hope that 
some of this actually resonated with a lot of people who are listening to this if you want to know more about the program that sandeep is also part of uh, there's a link in the description go check that out do tell us how you liked this particular episode uh, do tell us if you have any questions for sandeep in the comments box and then we will make sure that we send some of them to him for him to answer and do tell us which other guests you want uh, us to bring on this chair as conversations cafe podcast close thank you very much and keep sharing and loving us thank, thank you. you thank you so much thank you